me in our call to worship this morning. I lift my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Let us praise the Lord, who is our keeper. <coughs> praise the Lord indeed. Hallelujah. Kyle did. 
Um, but baby Ezra U. Bates was born last night um, at five pounds, six ounces, and uh, did get an email this morning. He was planned, it was planned to have him born in uh, Little Rock at Children's Hospital because of an existing medical condition. And so I know he's been taken there this morning. Uh, haven't heard any word of emergency or anything like that. I think it was standard because of the pre-existing medical condition, but everything is well, uh, and we want to pray for uh, the Bates and the Kilgore families. Uh, and then uh, talking to BJ this morning, her daughter Danielle, uh, who was eight months pregnant, fell yesterday um, and got bruised up, but the doctors say the baby is doing very well and just, you know, kind of took it as a roller coaster ride, I guess. So um, anyway, so we'll continue to pray that all goes well with them. <coughs> I am glad that you're here to worship today. Let's go to God in prayer. <coughs> Lord, we do give you thanks for the gift of new life, and we pray for your protection. For each of these babies that we've talked about this morning and the parents and grandparents, we are, uh, we just celebrate the, the blessing, the symbolism of new life. For we know that it is in you and through you and your son Jesus that we are offered new life. So we come together to praise you today. To sing your name. To listen for your voice. To just be in communion with you. And with our brothers and sisters in the body. We pray that you bless our time together. That you help us grow. That you strengthen our faith. But it's not only for our own account. Lord, for we know, we have heard your call, that you, are, you have sent forth your people to those who are in need, to those who have yet to hear, to those who have heard and turned away, to those who are lost. So indeed, Lord, strengthen us Pour forth your spirit over your church so that we might be empowered to share the hope of the gospel, to share the love of your son Jesus, to share the gift of your unfailing grace with all of the world. And all of this we pray in the name of our Savior, your Son, Jesus the Messiah. The one who taught us that when we pray, we should pray in this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now I'm looking out there and I know I have one, one child back in the back. It's children's moments time. Is she brave enough to come up here by herself? Of course she is. Come on, come on now. I just have to change my camera angle. I tell you what, I'm gonna let you I'm gonna let you sit on that stool if you want to. You wanna sit up on that stool? You get there? Not really? Wow. Now you're there, aren't you? You probably haven't met my friend Tammy. This is my friend, Tammy. Beep, beep. Beep, 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 beep. Tammy says, what's your name? Chloe. I could have told you that. It's Chloe. Ah, Tammy. Tammy says, hi, she's glad you're here. Beep, 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 beep. 
Are you kidding me? Beep, 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 beep. You know what she said? She said her friend Ricky, Ricky's a raccoon. He he stuck he got stuck in a trap. And, and he's way over on the other side of the forest. And she's supposed to go help him. You think she ought to go help him? Okay, but wait a minute, wait a minute. Really? She's wait a minute. She's got to go through an open field, and there's hawks that fly over the open field, right? She's got to go across a road, and she's got to go through a creek, because Ricky's on the other side of all of that. Do you think she still ought to go help him? You think so? But what bad things could happen if she went to help? Think about it. She could get stuck. She could get stuck? Yeah, she could get stuck. She said she don't want to get stuck. <laughs> what else could happen? She could go across the creek. She says, I don't swim very well. She, she doesn't want to fall in the water. Is there anything else that could happen? She got to cross a road. You could get hit by a car. <laughs> that doesn't sound very fun. And you know what else? I, she said she doesn't want to know anything else. That's a lot. It's a lot of reasons to not go help her friend, isn't it? In that field, those hawks, you know what hawks eat? Chipmunks. A hawk could swoop down and grab her. Fly away. That's not fun, is it? So do you think she still ought to go help Ricky? No. <laughs> she thinks that's a good thing. But but Ricky is her friend. And she loves Ricky. Yeah. So do you think she ought to go help Ricky? She has to. She has to, doesn't she? She has because he's her friend. Sometimes, sometimes when we love people. We have to do things that are not easy, uh, like cross the road, like swim through a creek, like go through a field, uh, like get stuck somewhere. Oh, man. But Jesus loved us enough that he went through all kinds of really hard stuff so that we would know how much he loves us and how much God loves us. And you know what? Tammy, Tammy, are you going to go? She's going to go help Ricky when we get through. She's going to go help Ricky get out of that trap, okay? Because even though she's scared, she loves Ricky. Just like Jesus loves you. And he went through some very tough stuff so that you would know how much he loves you. Um, sometimes we have to do that for our friends. All right? Okay, let's pray. Can you repeat after me? Dear God, Dear God thank you for loving us. And sending, Jesus and sending Jesus to show us that love. To show us that love. Help us, Help us love, others. love others. Amen. Amen. Awesome job. <laughs> she said she's glad you came. You need help now? Whoop, there you go. Good job. Tell her good job. <laughs> That's pretty scary to come up here by yourself with me. I mean, I don't even want to be up here by myself with me. So, that's awesome. Thank you, Chloe. <clears throat> that is your vacation Bible school at work right there. I say amen to vacation Bible school today. Amen. amen. Let's go to God in prayer. <clears throat> Lord, as I come to this time, I pray that you are empower my voice to carry your message. Not my message alone, not anybody else's, but open us to hear what you have to say today. Through what I say or in spite of what I say. And this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so when it comes to big decisions, what are some things you th you do to help you make that decision? Pray. Pray. That's a good one to start with right there, pray. I hope that when you have a decision to make, you're praying about that decision, especially if it's an important decision. 
What else might you do to help you make a, an important decision? Ask advice. Ask advice from somebody that, you know, List. might know something. Do what? List pros and cons. List pros and cons. Boy, I'm so glad you said that one today. Uh, it's almost like somebody whispered in your ear, say list pros and cons. Um, I did. <laughs> <laughs> prayer and advice. And, and what I find helpful sometimes is to make a list of pros and cons. Now, that's not too bad when we're doing something easy like trying to decide between Mexican food or pizza. I mean, Mexican food wins about 9 out of 10 times on the pros and cons list, but every now and then you just got to have a good pizza. And that's an easy one to do. Sometimes when we're making decisions, they're not quite that easy. Like the decision to preach this sermon. It was not an easy decision. It's not what I planned. It's not what I intended. It's not what I prepared for this week. And it's not the easy way out. And sometimes that's what you try to look for, isn't it? The easy way out. And I do want to say that as I get into this sermon, please know that it was not coerced, it was not forced, it wasn't even urged by anybody. Well, okay, maybe one. But it's about making a tough decision. And the scripture I want to turn to today is about a time when Jesus faced probably is the toughest decision he ever had to make. And I know this is not the right time of the year to read this scripture. It's usually a Monday Thursday thing. It's usually a Good Friday thing. But we are facing some tough issues in our country right now. We have some tough decisions to make. And so I'm going to be reading from Matthew chapter 26, verse 36 through 46, where Jesus has a decision to make in the garden. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He, he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and agitated. Then he said to them, I am deeply grieved even to death. Remain here and stay awake with me. And going a little further, he, he threw himself on the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So you could not stay awake with me one hour? Stay awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again he went away for the second time and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Jesus knew what the cup held. Jesus knew what was coming. That cup held torture and pain and humiliation and death. And it was no longer way out there in the future. It was imminent within just a few hours. And so he goes to God in prayer and he prays, are there other paths to take? Are there any other options you can give me? Anything, please God, anything but that. But then he said those famous words, not my will, but yours. Sometimes we struggle with that. Thinking about the cross being the will of God and the pain being the will of God. Because we want to think consequence of evil. But we, want, we ask, is that really the plan of God? Is it really a necessary step? Is that a, a, a forced thing that was forced on Jesus? Was it inevitable? Is it a, a little bit of all of the above? And the answer is yes and no and maybe. But what I want to focus on is that the fact that Jesus, Jesus chose this path. 
that led to the cross. Jesus took the nails that led to his death. In his book, He Chose the Nails, Max Lucado invites us to, to examine the cross and to contemplate its purpose and, and to celebrate its significance. He says, go ahead and linger on the hill of Calvary and see just how much God did to win your heart. See how much God chose to do. See what Jesus chose to do to win your heart. There's a song that came out in 2013 by a gospel group out of Tennessee called The Browders. I don't know if anybody heard of The Browders. I had not heard of The Browders until I started looking. I'd heard this song, but I didn't know The Browders until I looked it up. Um, and it's called He Took the Nails. He Took the Nails. And I'm going to play just a short clip of this song. He took my that song because it's pretty much an accepted thing that Jesus made the decision. He knew what was coming. He made the decision. Jesus chose the cross. But it's also clear that he struggled with that decision. This wasn't an easy thing for him to decide. The, the scripture we read shows how much he struggled. If you read all the gospel accounts, you know that he even sweated drops of blood as he grieved over what was coming. Now, I don't know, maybe I'm a little strange. Okay, now, don't nobody comment on that. I'm a little strange. But have you ever wondered if Jesus made a pros and cons list when it came to the crucifixion? I mean, he knew for a long time it was coming. Do you think he sat down and made a pros and cons list? I he might have. He might have. And so I took the liberty to, to think up some reasons he might have written on the, on the con side. Reasons to not go to the cross. And my number one reason is Jesus looked at what was happening and he said, all of this that's going on is a religious farce. They're trying to cover up the truth of God. And if I die, I won't be able to expose their lives. That's a pretty good reason to not go, right? I think so. Because I made up the list, so I would think so. <laughs> Second one is this. This is a Roman and Jewish government conspiracy to keep the peace in their land by ending my ministry. So I can't leave because I don't want them to win. It's another good reason. Number three, the personal risk would be too great. Yeah, that's a pretty high risk, isn't it? Anybody, come on, somebody say, yes, death is a high risk. Thank you. So cooperative. Number four, evil would win. Evil would win. It's a good reason not to go. To, to, the appearance that evil wins is a good reason not to go. Number five, this is my favorite. His ministry would be left in the hands of his capable disciples. The ones who denied him and betrayed him and who argued all the time and who fled when the trouble got going. You know, those guys. Another good reason to stay. N number six, it wasn't on his bucket list. He didn't want to do this. I mean, I want to go. To, I, I've been to Egypt, check. Uh, I, I traveled to Galilee, check. I've traveled to Jerusalem, check. I want to die on a cross. That's not on his bucket list. That doesn't sound like fun, right? It's a good reason not to do it. It's painful. And finally, it wasn't logical. It didn't make sense. 
how would a death further his cause and his ministry on earth? Those are, that's just my list. I just, you know, if you think of another one, feel free to shout it out. What's another reason Jesus might have said no to the cross? Would have been on his car. What? It hurt. It hurt. That's right. That's painful. See, that right there is enough, isn't it? That, that right there is a good enough excuse to run and hide and make a whole new strategy. But then I got to thinking about what was on Jesus' pros list. I mean, you got to have pros and cons, right? You got to have something to weigh against the cons. If I just had that cons list, I'd be gone. So what's on his pros list? And we know the final straw out of this this scripture is that he turned to God and he said, "What's your will, Father?" And apparently, his Father's will was that he went through it. But what stood behind his obedience? To the Father's will. What was on the pros list that, that, that pushed him to, to obey? John 3.16 comes to mind, and the word is love. Love, compassion, and mercy. For God so loved the world. For God loved the world in this way, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Love is on the pros list. But love of who? Just love of God, obeying God? No, love of friends. He had his disciples. You remember what he told him the told them the night before? In John chapter 15, verses 12 and 13, it says, Love one another as I have loved you, and there's no greater love than this than to lay down one's life for one's friend. He loved his friends enough that he went to the cross. But he didn't just stop with his friends. He loved his neighbor. His whole ministry was about loving neighbor, even loving people you didn't know, hadn't met yet, because he loved two people on the cross that were, that were criminals that were hung beside him that we don't know he probably hadn't met before then. <coughs> but his love didn't stop there either. You know what else was on his pros list? Me. Me, I was on his pros list, and you were too. Love for me and love for you were on his pro list. And love for the person who's sitting next to you. I know that's hard to fathom, isn't it, right? I want you to turn, turn to the person next to you and look them in the face and say, he did it for you. Go ahead, do it. If you don't have somebody next to you, just kind of imagine. Hi, Maggie, he did it for you, yeah. Hi, BJ, he did it for you. Now, if you didn't get it said to you, I want somebody to say it to you, too. Turn around and reverse it and, you know. I want to make sure everybody in here knows that you were on the pro list. His love for others, his love for us, overcame all those other items on the con list. Even the best ones. There were some good ones. You got to admit that was a good list. But his love for us overcame all of those other reasons. And aren't you glad? Because, because his decision saved our lives. He took the nails and we received life. And his decision to, to sacrifice self for our benefit becomes the model for his followers. Not just the ones back then, but for us today as well. And oh, how I'd love to stop this sermon right there. Because that's not a bad sermon just by itself. We all need to be reminded of what Jesus did for us, right? But I can't. I can't. Now, I have to say it's a, a difficult decision to continue on with this one, but I didn't shed you know, sweat drops of blood as I was going through. It's, it's tough, but maybe not that tough. But here goes. Y'all know me well enough to know I'm not a political person. I'm just not. Uh, I love our government. I love our country. But I think right now I have a sincere distrust and distaste for politics from one side to the other of the spectrum. 
And I try really hard to keep politics out of the pulpit. But sometimes faith overlaps politics. And it has to influence politics. But believe me, faith always trumps politics. Maybe that's a bad pun. Is that a bad pun? <laughs> faith trumps politics. I want you to hear that. Yeah, trumps politics. Get it? Okay. Now, you got it the third time through. I'm proud of you. And I want to assure you that this sermon is not a political sermon. It's not influenced by any political party, any political person, to carry on with the sermon. The same can be said of media. I know the media is doing the best they can to do their job, but right now, most media, especially social media, has become so agenda-driven that it's hard to deem what is the truth when you just listen to the media. You better research a little further. You better rely on more and, and better information. So let me just say that this sermon is not media-driven. Yes, some of the numbers may come from media, but they're also backed up from other places, not just media. Because you see, I don't necessarily know what is truth from politics or media. But here's what I do know. I know suffering. And I understand grieving. And I see pain. And I feel the impacts it has. Those things I know to be true. You know what else I don't like? And what I know... I know I don't like it when we can't gather to worship because of a pandemic. That was 15 hard, hard months for all of us. And yeah, we adjusted. Yeah, we adapted. Yeah, we did some cool stuff. But I don't like it when we can't wor worship together. I know how hard that is. Now, just a reminder. I was not forced, I was not coerced, I was not guilted, I was not otherwise led by any higher-ups to write or preach this sermon. Okay, one higher-up, way higher, to write this sermon. And for the record, let it be said, I hate needles. I hate needles. Always have hated needles. I don't fear them like I used to because I've had enough of them now. I know they just... Don't hurt as bad as I used to think they hurt, but I hate needles. <clears throat> COVID is resurging. The Delta variant is real. 297 new cases in Sebastian County in the last two weeks, over 1,000 a day in Arkansas for the last several days in a row, 1,300 I believe it was yesterday, and word from medical staff, not I'm not, not getting this from media, not getting it from politicians, word from medical staff that hospitalizations, people in ICU, people on ventilators are going up every day. And most are unvaccinated. Most. Many of those are young and children. There are some exceptions, but the symptoms are mild, but most are unvaccinated. And the highest rates in the country of infected people are in the areas where we have the lowest rates of vaccination. Can anybody say, yay, Arkansas, because we're down at the bottom? That's sarcastic, by the way. <coughs> and the highest rates of infection in Arkansas are in the counties that have the lowest vaccination rates. Imagine that. Can anybody say, yay, Sebastian County, because guess where we are? And yes, I know there are other issues in this world that are important. Yes, I know there are other killer, killer diseases that we need to worry about. Yes, I know all of that, but, but this is one we've been given some things that we know can make a difference. They're not easy. Social distancing is not easy. I've already told you, I love being together as a church, and I have this... I have this huge fear right now of what would happen to not only our church, but the church in general, if we had to go through another shutdown. 
of not being able to worship together. How many people would just say, I'm fed up, I'm not coming back? That's a fear. I know I'm not supposed to fear, I'm sorry. But it's a fear I have. I don't like distancing, but maybe maybe we need to be aware of it. Mask. I, I'm, not, I'm not fond of masks. I see some people have them on. Guess what? They've shown to help help keep us from spitting stuff out that spread the disease. It's not nearly as much about us taking stuff in as it's about keeping us from infecting others. And I don't like them, and it's hot this time of the year and uncomfortable. But sometimes we have to do things like that. And then, then there's this one, vaccinations. Did I, did I mention that I hate needles? Yeah. I hate needles. But vaccinations appear to be the most helpful right now. And, and this may or may not affect you directly because you may have already been vaccinated. You may have already made your decision, and that's fine. I'm good with that. And most churches, most churches that I'm aware of, at least Methodist churches that I know the clergy, uh, who have done anonymous surveys of their congregation are running well above the state average or the county average. They're running 85, 90, 95 percent. And so I may be preaching to the choir, and that's fine. It's still a helpful thing to hear. Because we are still in one of the lowest vaccinated counties, in one of the lowest vaccinated states in the country. And I believe it's having an impact. We have some decisions to make as a country, and I hope you're praying. But I hope you can also go beyond that and consider pros and cons. Here's my cons list. Why not to get a vaccination, okay? I hate needles. <laughs> I know you've probably figured that out by now. That's a good con. If you don't like needles, I get it. I get it. Don't get a shot. You don't trust the vaccines or the people who are promoting them. It's a good, good reason to not do it. It's a government conspiracy. Believe me, I think this has been too politicized from the very onset from both sides, and it really bothers me that we've let politics guide a medical issue and affect us. And sometimes I wonder if the parties got switched as to who was promoting and who was against, if the whole number of people uh, might stay the same who've been vaccinated, it'd just be different people. And that's a shame because it's a medical issue, not a political one. But, but I get using that as a, as a, you know, that's one of the reasons to not get vaccinated. Side effects. Side effects of vaccinations are possible. They're real. They're out there. Some of them are severe, but they're great. But it's a, it's a legitimate reason to not get vaccinated. Personal freedom. It's my body, my choice, right? My body, my choice. Man, I, we, we got to have that. We got to have, we got to have the freedom to say, I get to choose what happens to me. But I'm also reminded that Paul wrote one time that all things may be lawful, but not all things are beneficial, not all things build up. So I just keep that in my mind when I consider those personal freedoms. Next, the benefits not worth the personal risk. There are some risks that go involved that are involved with getting a vaccination, and I'm not sure the benefit is worth the risk. Because I might just get a little bit sick, or I might not get sick at all without getting vaccinated, so why do it? I get it. I get it. That's, a, that's another, another con. If I ignore it, the whole issue will go away someday. Sweep it under the rug. And finally, politics will figure it out, and it'll be over because it was all political to begin with anyway. So just ignore it. It'll go away. It won't bother me. And last but not least, too inconvenient to get a vaccination. Now, that may have been true early on. I'm not sure it's that true anymore because I think you can go get one if you want one. But you still have to go get one. You still have to sign up. You still have to carry a card. It, it can be too inconvenient. I get it. That's my cons list. And I'm sure you could add to them. And then I started putting together my pros list, and I figured out, you know what, if I just throw out a generic pros list, I am opening up a can of worms, and we might not ever get out of here today. 
So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you my specific pros list. This is the list that I use in making my choice to get vaccinated. My wife is a cancer survivor with a compromised immune system. And I love her too much to put her at risk. And guess what? I, I figured that almost every family that I meet with has somebody that is a cancer survivor. Every church that I would ever pastor has somebody that is a cancer survivor, has an immune uh, compromised immune system. So that extends beyond just my wife. Number two, you are important to me. And your kids and your grandkids are precious to me. And I want to protect them. Number three, my ability to do ministry as I have been called to do it is limited without the vaccine. I can't go where I need to go. I can't see who I need to see. I can't do what I need to do unless I'm vaccinated. It's on my pros list. Believe it or not, I actually do enjoy doing ministry. And fourth and finally, I cannot bear the personal responsibility of making someone, anyone, doesn't matter who, anyone deathly ill or worse having them die when I could have done something to avoid it. It's why I don't text and drive. It's why I don't drink and drive. Well, there's lots of reasons I don't drink and drive, but it's one of the reasons I don't do those things. It's because I cannot bear the responsibility of knowing that there was something I could do to keep you out of harm's way and I didn't do it and you got sick and died. I don't know how I could live with myself. And I know what some of you are probably thinking, but not everybody who gets COVID gets hospitalized, and not everybody who gets COVID goes into ICU, and not everybody who gets COVID is put on a ventilator, and not everybody who gets COVID dies from it, and you are absolutely right. They don't. But if my being vaccinated saves even one person from any of those four options, then for me, the benefit outweighs the risk. And that's kind of in line with John 15, verses 12 and 13. To lay down self for the sake of others out of love. And look, I can't tell you what to do. I can't tell you what to do. Well, I could, but it wouldn't do any good. I, you've been listening to me for 13 years and hadn't done anything I said yet. Teasing. I won't tell you what to do. I won't say you have to do it because I know the response. Because when I get told I have to do something, you know what I say? Uh-uh. Don't tell me I have to or I won't. So I'm not going to tell you you have to. But I will say this. The evidence is mounting. And it's mounting up enough to say that if we really care about each other, if we love our neighbors, then there is a benefit in making a personal sacrifice on their behalf by getting vaccinated. Look, I'm not asking you to take the nails. I'm not asking you to choose the cross. I'm not asking you to literally die for the sake and the sins of others. Praise God, Jesus did that already, and we don't have to. I'm just asking that you prayerfully consider how you are being led to best love your loved ones. To best love your neighbors. To best love people you may not even know. And yes, to best love your enemy. See, it's a Jesus thing. He, he kind of said that a time or two. And to do that when it comes to your own personal choices regarding how you respond to this resurgence of the COVID-19 virus. There were a lot of good reasons, a lot of good reasons, valid reasons for Jesus to have run from the cross. But out of love for others, he chose to run toward it. It didn't seem to make sense at the time, but he took the nails because he loves us, because he loves you. And for the sake of all humankind, he laid down his life. He chose the cross. We're just being asked to choose a needle. 
He, he took the nails. We're just being asked to take some shots. And, and we're being asked to do so not just for ourselves, but for the sake of our neighbors. And you see, even if you've already got your shot, this is important because you're going to be talking to people who haven't. And they're going to be asking why they should. And maybe you need to think about these things. If you haven't, maybe you need to think about these things. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just saying make your list. Make your list and make a decision. That let love be at the top of your list. Let's pray. God, forgive me if I've spoken out of line, but I've done so on behalf of the people that you love. Help us. Help us as your people, as your church, to model the love of Christ in our decisions. A love that lays down self, for the sake of others. And this I pray in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand as we sing our closing song, which is called The Gift of Love. Please stand.